is that I wrote an essay um, in 2004 called Too Diverse? Question mark, and it was directed very much at um, at modern liberalism, saying, "Look, there's a conflict here between your two most cherished ideas: the idea of diversity and the idea of solidarity." You know, and just taking a common sense view of human psychology that you're more likely to trust and and be willing to share with people who you have something in common with. Now, you don't actually have to look like them or even pray to the same God as them, but you have to share norms or experiences or something. Um, and, you know, and the people who are sort of thrusting diversity as the ultimate good down our throats the whole time don't seem to kind of get that. You know, if you want to, uh, I mean, I mean it, you know, you can have lots of diversity if you don't mind living in a hyper individualistic society where people don't share their 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 their, their tax income to, to have decent you know welfare services um, decent pensions or or, or or health services or whatever uh, but so you know you need to keep some sort of rein on um, the or how fragmented and diverse your society is becoming you know if, if you want a high degree of sharing. And it seemed to me common sense in a way. Anyway, the, that essay, it was a kind of 5,000 word essay and it was printed, the entire thing, obviously with my permission, was printed in the main um, sort of left liberal newspaper here, The Guardian. Uh, and that that caused... Uh, Pushing <laughs> caused, back against the sacred words. You're not supposed to go against the sacred words. <laughs> um, anyway, that did cause... You know, so that was my first experience of being sort of a, a heretic, as it were, from my own liberal tribe. Um, Were so, you but, tossed out in the way that you would be today if you if you came out with such heresy? Well, I mean, in some ways, I guess I, I hadn't really thought of that before, actually. But I guess I was lucky that, in a way, this happened before the era of social media. So, you know, I didn't I didn't get the kind of pile on that I would have got today for for writing such a thing. Uh, but there was, you know, there was you know, huge debates in the Guardian about it, and. Um, uh, when I then became, uh, it was interesting because it was a time when, you know, immigration was was increasing very fast. And I was, you know, I was a mass immigration skeptic. Um, and I, you know, uh, partly for the reasons I, I've just described. Um, and I was also a little bit skeptical about multiculturalism, again, for the reasons I've described. I mean, I think, I mean, it depends what you mean by multiculturalism, of course. But I mean, you know, if you allow, you know, if you say to people, you know, come here, come, come and live in this country and just be yourself. You know, you don't have to make any adaptation to it. You don't, don't, you don't need to learn English. You don't need to adopt the kind of common norms of our of our society. You know, that seems to that form of multiculturalism, or what we might call sort of laissez-faire multiculturalism, is is an absolute disaster. It seemed to me. Um, so I was a multiculturalism skeptic and a mass immigration skeptic, partly derived from that that the sort of diversity versus solidarity or the or, or, or you know the tension that I saw between those two. You know, it's not it's not an unovercomable tension. Uh, you know, you can you can overcome the or you can mitigate the tension. Um, but but you know you have to you have to worry about it. You have to think carefully about it. Anyway, um, that um, 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 I, I sort of became for the BBC. You know, the main the main uh, sort of official um, source of news. Uh, on TV and radio, I, I became the sort of go-to guy, the, the, the liberal who was skeptical about immigration and multiculturalism. So, um, uh, you know, because you know, the BBC tends to itself to be quite liberal. So, but I was, I was an acceptable person to come on and say, you know, immigration is too high because they couldn't get, you know, a kind of, you know, someone, someone who'd been saying that for for decades, you know, a conservative person saying it was unacceptable. That's not interesting, right? The interesting yeah. thing is there's a liberal here that thinks yeah. this, yeah, which yeah. is against the grain. Yeah. Yeah. So as you um, are talking, it's, it strikes me for anybody that's only listening to it, they don't realize that just over your shoulder, you have the Tower of Babel, which is uh, mm. well painted onto a, onto a picture in your wall. But like, I, it strikes me that, um, the anywhere people are encouraging a future of which like other cultures in our past, the Bible stories of the Tower of Babel have said, be careful, right? Like the the carefulness of the story of the Tower of Babel to me is more than just having hubris that you think you can build a, uh, a tower to God, but it, but it also of we can just keep pushing things together and it will just work because as soon as they spoke different languages, as soon as they thought different things, they scattered out. Mm. 
where is your thought on this this concept of the Tower of Babel and how it fits with somewhere and anywhere people? Yeah, um, I, I'd never really thought about the, the decorations in my front room as being so relevant to, <laughs> to the things I've been writing about, but you're right. Um, and of course, the Tower of Babel, people often forget that, as it were, the reason why the Tower of Babel became impossible to build, you know, it's, it's a construction site because God was reacting against the hubris, the, the human hubris that we could build this great tower to heaven. Um, it's the same, it's the same kind of, I mean, the, the hubris is evil is also, of course, one of the themes of Milton's Paradise Lost. You know, the devil is a very attractive figure in Paradise Lost, which is often rather confused people. But, but, but he's kind of he, he's he's a kind of rational, a rationalist, hubristic rationalist. And and you could indeed say that kind of you know anywhere, you know, too, you know too much kind of anywhere thinking has. That, that doesn't take account of certain fundamental sort of truths of 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 human well-being in a way you know the the need to belong somewhere uh, the need to be you know to feel part of something bigger than yourself to feel part of a of a tribe if you like um, now you know in in modern societies it can and indeed should be a porous tribe you know the one that you know does welcome other people that people you know people but still something you know a structure that you're that you're part of, um, and uh, you know, and, and you know, anywhere thinking does, as I said earlier, tend to be very. I mean, even though you know, anywhere thinking is more associated with the left than the right, to use the old-fashioned terms. I mean, anywheres tend to be very individualistic, um, and they, you know, or, or you know, modern liberalism, for want of a better word, you know, has has not, you know, one of one of its weaknesses has been its inability to deal with. Uh, the, the, you know the human desire to belong, um, and 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 to feel continuity in your life, and indeed to respect tradition. Um, you know, not uncritically, but you know that that actually we've done things in a certain way for a very long time because they work quite well. Um, now we may want to amend them, but we don't necessarily want to chuck them out completely and start again. I mean, the, you know that that hubristic rationalism. Of you know you could say of a lot of modern woke culture too. So you know in relations between men and women, for example, you know we of course things have changed, and um, you know most mainstream most of mainstream society in the U.S. or, or Europe now accepts a, a kind of a, 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 an underlying equality between men and women that that you know three or four generations ago would have been seen as slightly eccentric. Now it's part of common sense, but that doesn't mean to say. That we think that men and women are the same, um, or that we should just completely junk a, a, a gender division of labour. I mean, of course we shouldn't. Um, um, uh, you know, uh, I mean, it's sort of again. <laughs> um, but the, you know, this is this is what a lot of um, a lot of people. You know, so people complain about a gender pay gap, um, which is which is primarily the result of. Of the prefer of of female preferences. I mean, you know, women, you know, not all, but most women want to have children. They want to have families, and for a period when children are very young, they want to put family first, or or at least, um, or at least be able to work part time. And if you work part time, uh, you know, it's it's much it's you know, you, you know. Whereas men still, you know, to, to, through that period, tend to still put a bigger focus of their of their lives goes into their it goes into their working life and I mean you know, that that you know that that's not going to change and uh, but it, but a lot of uh, but you know the the attempt to sort of delegitimize that seems to be completely wrong headed. Um, I mean, what we want is for people to have the choice. What we want women to have the choice. You know, some women, um, you know, don't want to have kids at all. Want to have kids and go straight back to work. You know, they got successful professional careers, but lots of women. Uh, want you know, as it were, a kind of more more conventional ability to, to to be able to afford to stay at home when children are very young and so on. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the one of the kind of weaknesses of modern feminism is it's become kind of illiberal almost, in, and it kind of looks down on women who have more traditional priorities. <laughs> 
Thanks for checking out this podcast short. If you like this interview, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button and hit that bell so you always get notified about this podcast. And if you're really interested in conversations like this, you may want to consider joining the Articulate Ventures Network. To find out more, go to network.articulate.ventures.